Clay. Clay, can you fix this? Can you fix this? It's just right one. I don't know what's going on. Mm -hmm. Hello. There we go. Which one is it, my, uh, Clay? It is? Oh. Good morning. All right. Let's all stand. Uh, I got one person with a migraine I want to pray for, Miss Rebecca. Uh, do we got any other sicknesses? I know there's some that are sick. Bill and Patricia? Okay. And, and, all right. Um, Rob, can you get the, the back lights? Can y'all all point your hand towards the camera? All right. Dear Heavenly Father, we come to you this morning. Uh, you, your word says that uh, by his stripes we are healed. Your word also says that um, if there be any sick among you, to come before the elders, anoint with oil and pray the prayer of faith, they shall be made whole. So, Father, we, as, as Paul prayed and anointed handkerchiefs and they took them to the sick and they were healed, Father, we have the, the ability through the airways of today's technology to to extend our faith through the camera. We just ask that you touch Rebecca and Patricia and Bill. We ask that you make them whole. We ask, Holy Spirit, you anoint them. We ask that you ease the migraine pain, Father. Open the vessels and let the blood flow. And for Bill and Patricia, Father God, we just ask that you touch their whole bodies. Give them restoration. As they, as they take it easy today, Father God, re refresh their bodies, Father. We thank you for it. We lift up Haley. We ask her to be made whole in Jesus' name. Father, this is your day and this is your yes. time. Yes, we come to you this morning and <clears throat> we have a word and we have some songs. But Holy Spirit, this is your time. Yes. Lead us into the will of the Father. Help us to lift up Jesus that all men may be drawn unto him. That they may come to know him as Savior, yes. as Lord, as Master, as Friend stand by as partner. Father, we love you and we praise you and we say yes and amen to whatever you have today. Let our ears be in tune to the Holy Spirit. Let our hearts be inclined towards you and let our souls let our souls yield unto the will of the Spirit. Father, we say yes and amen. All God's people said Amen. Come on up here and let's worship the king. Praise and worship. Y'all ready? Anybody can play drums. Please see me. Grayson, can you? So does uh, my grandson. I need to get him going. Y'all ready? Let's go.
know there is peace within your presence. I speak Jesus. Let's just sing that verse one again. I speak Jesus. And I just want to speak the name of Jesus over every heart and every mind. Because I know there is peace within your presence. I speak Jesus, I want to speak your name, Jesus. And I just want to speak the name of Jesus. Till every dark addiction starts to break. Declaring there is hope and there is freedom. I speak Jesus. Sing that verse again, sing verse two again. I just want to speak the name of Jesus, come on, till every dark addiction starts to break, declaring there is hope and there is freedom, I speak Jesus, your name is power, your name is power, your name is healing. Shout 
so beautiful, Jesus. We're so thankful for your presence here this morning. Holy Spirit, I just pray that you would continue to consume every heart, that you would break through every barrier, that you would shine through all darkness, Lord, and you would show yourself faithful and true. that there was a purity of the presence of God, the fire of God that was literally coming upon some hearts that was filling in some gaps. There, It's like there were pieces that were not filled in, but the presence of God was filling in those, those gaps and those cracks to bring wholeness into that area. So, Father, we thank you for the work of your spirit in our hearts this morning. so good, God. What a sweet presence of Jesus this morning. Let's bow our heads. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for your mighty presence in this room today. We thank you, Father God, for the touch. As my wife said, the sweet spirit in this room. So, as I was praying for Ernest, scripture came to my mind and I, I had talked about it to me several weeks ago Luke uh, 13 or 15 21 says the son said to him father I have sinned against heaven and against you and I am no longer worthy to be called your son but the father not listening to him at all said to his servants, quick, bring the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Bring the fatted calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate. For this is the son of man was dead. The son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. So they began to celebrate. Yes. But this is the key right here. This is to all of us that have stayed. Meanwhile, the older son was in the house, in the field. When, the, when he came near the house, he heard music and dancing. So he called one of the servants and asked him, what is going on? Your brother has come. He replied, your father has killed the fatted calf. And because he was, he has him back safe and sound. The older brother became angry refused to go in. So his father went out and pleaded with him. There's a lot of prodigals that are going to come home. Yes. Yes. Come yes. We are, are we going to celebrate or are we going to be upset because God puts them back in the roles that they were supposed to be in? Because what was spoken over them is not going to be voided yes. just because of their mistakes. 
Amen. Amen. Father, we call them forth, north, south, east, and west. We say, come forth. Come forward, come forward, come forward. We stand welcoming, welcoming them, open arms, saying, yes, come home. You are welcome. Father, we love you, we praise you, and we thank you. We ask that you touch their hearts. Bring them back into the fold. In Jesus' name, and all God's people said, amen and amen. Hug 14 people before you go back to your seat. Good morning. Good morning. How y'all doing? Did you hug 14 people? That's a lot of people. Did y'all go back there and hug Billy? I can't find it, so I'll just wing it. Abraham is just about to have his promise come true. He's about to get Isaac. Sarah's about to get her name changed. But right before that, he has an encounter. uh, There are several kings that are fighting and Abraham wins the battle and he is multiplied. And he takes that, a tithe out of that, and he brings it to Melchizedek, Melchizedek, excuse me, and makes an offering. This is before tithes and offerings were mentioned in the, in the, in the law. Tithes and offerings are a condition of the heart. They're not a law. They're not a, 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 a mandate from the church. It's a representation. As God gave his son to us as a first fruit for all of us to become sons and daughters of the Most High God. So he's the tithe. He's the first one that redeemed the rest of us. And that the, that's what the word teaches us, that our tithe redeems the rest of our money. How, how many have stuff break down a lot? How many loses a lot in, the, in their money? I promise you, if you will honor God and seek his face, uh, I, I love telling the story about, 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 about 
Billy and, and him hating me for a while, but he still tithed. He didn't come to church, but he still tithed. And when he didn't have a job, God took care of him. It's not about the church. It's really about you. And I've always said, if, if you'll tithe, God will bless you. And if you, don't, if you think it's about me, then tithe somewhere else and watch God bless you. Amen? Amen. Let's bow our heads. Where's my ushers? There's one beautiful. There's two beautiful. All right. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for the opportunity to come into your presence and, and worship you. Now, Father God, as we honor you this morning with our tithe, our first fruit, our offerings, we ask that you bless that, Father. We ask you that you cause it to multiply. Father, your word says that you give seed to the sower. Your word also says that you will give back to us, pressed down, shaken together, running over. And Father God, your word says that you redeem the rest of our our income. As we tithe for it, Father God, you, you can help things stay working longer. You give us better deals on our money. Father, you, you take care of us because you love us. And you're looking for a cheerful giver that will, will give according to your word. But more importantly, give because they love you. Father, we love you. We praise you. We give you all honor and give you all glory. And all God's people said, amen, amen and amen. Are you all ready to be blessed? Yes. We'll come back next week because I'm preaching. But this week, Pastor Annette is. Y'all give her a hand as she comes forward. Sunday school that do not be deceived. God is not mocked whatsoever. A man sows that too shall he reap. Amen. So when you reap to the self life, that's what you get. You get corruption is what the word says. But if you sow to the spirit, you reap life in the spirit. Amen. Amen. God is good. Well, I had no zero plan to minister today. So um, <laughs> but during prayer this morning, God started speaking some stuff to my heart, and then um, I had texted my husband, and then I was like, ah, you can do whatever you're going to do, whatever, and then James started to pray, and I wanted to punch him. I'm like, thanks a lot, James, because now i got to share it, and I haven't, like, I don't know if I got the thought all the way through, you know what I mean? So, y'all just bear with me, amen? I feel there's something prophetic happening today, very significant, so... Um, I'm not quite sure what I'm sensing in the spirit, but I know it's good stuff. Amen? Amen. So my prayer is today that you'll be encouraged. I hope to um, just make you feel like you're a million bucks today. And that you can go. I'm so glad you're here. I miss you when you're not here. I just want you to know. So I pull you back in prayer. <laughs> we were talking about you the other day because we were talking about, I was talking about you beating your son outside the daycare. She'd clock out, go outside. She'd just spank you to no end, and then she'd clock back in. <laughs> but we know you needed it. <laughs> he, turned out, he turned out all right. <laughs> we have lots of stories. Anyways, good stuff. I am going to, I actually have a lot of scripture. I told my husband, I said, I think it's more of a nugget, not really a word. He said, well, you're long-winded. You'll handle it. I'm like, you suck. Yes, you do. What did you say? Nah, I don't think you did. <laughs> now I've got to bend down. I know. My husband goes through these little phases. Like, he, like, it's just ridiculous. Whoever's the buyer, the buyer at Walmart, because we used to be buyers, so I understand this thought process. But, like, all of a sudden, like, he'll, he'll want caramel apple suckers. And he'll buy, like, 15,000 bags, and he eats them nonstop, like, constantly. He'll eat the suckers. And then he'll switch, and he'll, I don't know what you did the last time after that. But now he's on Lifesavers and <laughs> Butter Rum Lifesavers. And here's the thing. They're all individually wrapped. So I want you to imagine my life right now. With little clear wrappers everywhere. I mean everywhere. 
And I try so hard not to be a dripping faucet and nag him. But, man, I was just fussing him yesterday when he wasn't home. He was working hard. But I was vacuuming and picking nothing but these clear ones. They're everywhere. <laughs> I love you, honey. Oh, and, and ice cream sandwiches. Yeah. So he has, now he has to, like, have, you know, eight ice cream sandwiches a day. I just, it just, it's ridiculous. Anyways, amen. He opened up the freezer the other day, and uh, all the grandkids had eaten them all, and he was like, where's all my ice cream sandwiches? <laughs> I, was like, I guess, exactly. <laughs> I was talking to my cousin yesterday, and, uh, she, she had sent me this picture, and she said, hey, uh, you think you'd, it was Alabama, um, roll tide uh, thing, that you know, metal thing to put out front. She was like, do you think that you would use, wear, uh, use this? I said, yeah. And she was like, you know, you've got a pretty significant birthday coming up. I said, I know. I said, but Ricky's looking over the hill telling me what 60 looks like right now. <laughs> Once you get that 55, you're looking over the horizon. <laughs> Anyways, Lindell, I didn't give you scripture, but we're, we're going to only be in Luke, Matthew, and Acts. But I'm going to kind of go through these scriptures real quick. Jesus, I love you. Please, please help me this morning. I just want to encourage you this morning. I'm going to look at some scriptures from Peter, just kind of lay a foundation, and then I'm going to have you all participate in the message in a moment. So look at, let's go to Luke chapter 5, verse 3. Y'all ready? Luke chapter 5, verse 3. I'm going to do this without my glasses. There you go. We need to get the passion in large print because I'm not going to be able to read that when it comes out in the Bible. It's gonna, it, when they come out the whole thing, it's going to be such a teeny tiny print. So I'm using my Amplified. It says, uh, verse 3, And getting into one of the boats, the one that belonged to Simon Peter, he requested him to draw away a little from the shore, and then he sat down and continued to teach the crowd of people from the boat. And when he had stopped speaking, he said to Simon Peter, put out into the deep water and lower your nets for a haul. And Simon Peter answered, Master, we have toiled all night exhaustingly and caught nothing in our nets. But on the ground of your word, I will lower the nets again. And when they had done this, they caught a great number of fish. And as their nets uh, were at the point of breaking, and they signaled to their partners in the other boat to come and take a hold with them. And they came and they filled both the boats so that the be they began to sink. But when Simon Peter saw this, he fell down at Jesus' knees saying, Depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord. It says then they, in verse 9 that he was gripped with bewildering amazement. And all who were with him at the hall of fish which they have made. So I just want you to, I just want to point out that all of us, I hope, at some point have had that moment when Jesus has done something and we're like, you are the Lord. Like all of a sudden something clicks in your head, you get revelation and you're like, you're, you're, you're it. Because when, and when we first encounter Jesus, we do understand our own wickedness. We understand that we are human and that he is pure and he's holy and he's beautiful and he's, he's so He's so awesome. And when we first encounter that love, it is Im immediately comes back upon us that we know that we're, we're, we're born in a fallen, sick state. And he had this revelation. He fell down at Jesus' feet. So I think all of us have had that encounter. I hope. If you haven't, you can have it today. Um, but all of us have come to the point where, like, you are holy, you're Lord, and I'm not. Amen? And Jesus blessed him. So now let's go to chapter 6, verse 12, blah, blah, blah. Yes, we'll be in Luke for a while. Well, actually, then we'll go to Matthew and then we'll go back. Okay, so now listen to this. It says, now in the days that it occurred that he went up into the mountain to pray and spent the whole night in prayer to God. And when it was, that's Jesus, when it was day, he summoned his disciples and selected from them 12, uh, whom he named apostles, and they were Simon, whom he named Peter, and his brother Andrew, James, John, Philip, Bartholomew, Matthew, Thomas, James, Simon, the Zealot, and Judas, son of James, Judas Iscariot. Okay, so now, in this moment, Peter, who has just been walking after with Jesus, 
all of a sudden, he comes to this, to this realization. Jesus says, look, there is, a, there is a call on your life. You are chosen. And these 12 men are going to be, of course, we all know them. We know that they're the disciples and they're apostles. But just like with us, when we first encounter Jesus, we are all, we're, we understand the state of our heart. And then the next thing that we begin to understand is that Jesus has created us and called us for a specific purpose. We're not just wandering on the earth, lost with no destiny and no plan from God. But in this moment, Peter is chosen by Jesus. Now, Peter doesn't understand the scope of his calling, but he understands that Jesus is choosing him for a special purpose. And all of us come in our walk with God to this realization. We understand that we're sinners saved by grace, and then we realize that Jesus has fearfully and wonderfully made us. Speaking of that scripture right now, because when uh, Bill just texted me, the reason why he is sick today is because his blood pressure is so out of whack. And I'm just going, because my blood pressure the last couple of days has been so ridiculous. I don't know what is going on with my blood pressure. And as, when Bill texted me, I said, no, you are fearfully and you are wonderfully made. And it is not allowed to. And so my, so if, if anybody else have blood pressure issues in here? All right. We're going to say right now, amen. Y'all just lift your hands in prayer right now. I'm going to, I'm, we're canceling this stupid assignment. I'm done with it. So father, I just speak over every, every person, every body every specific physical temple that is dealing with high blood pressure and low blood pressure right now in the name of Jesus, I declare that it is coming back into alignment and, and, and it's going to be normal. It's because each one has been fearfully and wonderfully made. You created each one of these people. You created, you created each one of us and we are in alignment with your word of truth that we are healed and that we are whole and that everything in our body is aligned in the correct way, the way that you made us. So father, I just ask that your holy presence would just fill every temple in Jesus name and bring everything back into order. Hallelujah. I just got so hot. Amen. Am I like red? Oh, Jesus. Like seriously, I look in this thing. I am done with it. I've never had high blood, pressure, high blood pressure in my life, and I'm not, I'm not receiving it. Amen. So the enemy tried to tell me, well, your mom's got it, so you're probably going to get it. So I don't have a generational curse either. So anyways, just saying. All right. So we understand that we are sinners, and then we all realize that we are chosen by God for a specific purpose. Amen. So all of us need to understand as we're walking through life that I thought it was funny because when Jesus picks the 12 and then when he gets done, he goes and he preaches the Sermon on the Mount. And I never, I never actually recognized that before, but think about it. When Jesus chooses them, now I know he's speaking to the masses, but if you have just come to the realization that God has created you for purpose and the first message you hear is the Sermon on the Mount, blessed are those who are poor in spirit. Blessed are the meek, the pure at heart. Jesus is laying out a template. He's saying, look, when you are a disciple, when you are a doer of the word of God and not just merely a hearer, what we need to understand is the way that we live our lives is a declaration to Jesus. Uh, we talked in Sunday school last week about how our lives, you know, because we're attached to the kingdom of, uh, the kingdom of God, that our lives is, to, is, we're called to be a demonstration of the power of God and the love of God. Amen. So when we, we look at the Sermon on the Mount, it is, it's the template for our lives. This is how we, we function as believers, and we do what Jesus did because we live the way that he told us to. Amen? So that's a side note anyways. So let's swing over to Matthew real fast. You can keep your, you can keep your spot there in Luke because we're going to go back there. But I want to look at Matthew chapter 14, verse 25, I think. I was writing chicken scratch this morning. All right. Yes, verse 25. It says, In the fourth watch between 3 and 6 a.m. of the night, Jesus came to them walking on the sea. And when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were terrified and said, It's a ghost. And they screamed out with fright. But instantly he spoke to them saying, Take courage. I am. Stop being afraid. And Peter answered him, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. Isn't that some faith right there? So he said, come. And so Peter got out of the water and walked on the water, and he came towards Jesus. 
But when he perceived and felt the strong wind, he was frightened, and, as, and he began to sink. He cried out, Lord, save me. And instantly Jesus reached out his hand and caught and held him, saying to him, Oh, you little faith, why did you doubt? And then the wind ceased. Oh, isn't that incredible? How many of us, once we have come to the realization that Jesus is Lord, that we need to be new creations in Christ, and then we get to the place where we know that we're called and we're chosen and God's created us for purpose, and then we step out in faith. All of a sudden, you know that you're not allowed to just sit and do nothing, but God, he encourages you to meet him in a place where you think, I can't walk. There's no way that I can do this. I mean, it's as simple as this. Like when I, got, when I first got saved and was born again, the first thing that Jesus began to deal with in my life was me being an alcoholic. And God was like, you are not bound in addiction any longer. And so I had to step out of the boat because when I was getting prayer, um, little old Jan, she was an intercessor. She told me to go home and to dump all of my alcohol down the sink and say, in Jesus' name, this thing is broken off of me. And I... I couldn't throw it down the drain because I was like, that's just money. You know what I mean? So, uh, so I handed it all to him and told him to get rid of it. So, <laughs> but I said, in Jesus' name, this thing is broken off of me. And it was broken off of me for months. And then all of a sudden, crisis was going on in my life, and I looked away. And I ended up in the bar drinking again. I didn't get drunk. I spent hundreds of dollars and did not get drunk. It was so irritating. <laughs> Anyways, <laughs> that's another story. <laughs> but I stepped out of the boat that I was in and said, if Jesus said I could be free from this, I'm free from it. And I was walking and I was doing good. And then all of a sudden, stuff started happening. And I started looking around. And the next thing I know, I am sinking to the bottom and crying out for Jesus to help me. So no matter what it is, whatever you step out of for the first time, so, sometimes you don't last very long. You just take a few steps. But you know what's important is you got out of the boat. You just got out of the boat. All of us experience the bubbles of sinking. Amen? <laughs> not, not of gas in the water, but of, of sinking. <laughs> Y'all didn't even get it. Okay, let's go over to, <laughs> what word? Bubbles? Oh, what? I know I said. I'm, now, I'm thinking, now I'm thinking about Lindell. See, look what you did. As soon as that happens, I go back to the, my time in my life when I said, we are all living orgasms <laughs> instead of organisms. And Lindell was crying. I said, did I just say, and she was just nodding her head. Anyways. And it's hilarious. So. God keeps you humble, amen? So Luke chapter 9. <laughs> I promise I'm going somewhere. Let's go to Luke chapter 9, verse 1. Jesus called together the 12 and gave them power and authority over all demons and to cure diseases, and he sent them out to announce and preach the kingdom of God and bring healing. Jesus sent them out two by two. He said, guess what? Now, you, this is before Jesus died and before the outpouring of the Holy Ghost. This is so phenomenal to me. And so Jesus sent them out, and he said, now, I want you to go and do what I do. This is no longer about you stepping out of the boat. This is about you going to take my kingdom and my presence and my power to other people. And Jesus begins to make this declaration to our life, and we realize serving God is not all about me. Because when I first got saved, it was all about me. It was all about me, all about me. How, how God was going to bless me, how God was going to set me free, everything that Jesus was doing for me. And then all of a sudden, Jesus begins to shift our focus. And he's like, guess what? It's not all about you. I want you to go out to other people and give to other people what I have given you. And everything shifts in our mindset. We become more concerned about other people that they need what we have. It's the maturing process of every believer. We do not get to sit in our seat and just receive and receive and not pour out. Because when we do that, we become a dead sea. When we do that, we're no longer beneficial to anybody else because water is supposed to flow. Amen? All right. So that's the next stage of our walk. Now let's, let's run over real fast to Matthew chapter 16. 
keep your finger in Luke. We're going back. Matthew 16, verse 19. Oh, actually, let's go to verse 17. Oh, actually, no, go back further. Verse, verse 13. Hi, honey. I was, I was making notes in the dark. Y'all give me a break. Y'all get a message at an hour before church, and y'all come preach it. Okay, so <laughs> uh, Luke chapter, I mean, Matthew 16, verse, let's go to 13. It says, now when Jesus went to the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say that the Son of Man is? And they answered, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. And he said to them, but who do you yourself say that I am? And Simon Peter answered and replied, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And then Jesus answered him and said, Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood have not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And I tell you that you are Peter, a large piece of rock. And on this rock, Petra, a huge rock like Gibraltar, I will build my church and the gates of Hades, the powers of the infernal region, shall not overpower it or be strong to its detriment or hold against it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind, declare to be improper and lawful on earth must be what is already bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth must be what is already loosed in heaven. Wow. That's a shift in our walk with God, isn't it? We realize that we've been given the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Wow. That's powerful. That we actually, this is, we're start, Jesus is starting to open up to them the ecclesia, the, um, the government of God on the earth. So now this is no longer about you and I just going to church. It's not getting our church on. It, this is now coming to a whole different level that Jesus is now talking about a governmental assignment over every single believer where we have been given the keys of the kingdom of God, and by the authority of God, we get to open and we get to close whatever God says to open and to close. And so we are actually the ones who are directing the earth. We're supposed to be. Amen. So this is no longer about you just getting you done and then maybe praying for some people every once in a while. This is a whole other level. This is about what Jesus has planned from the beginning of, the cre of creation. It's powerful. So then, once again, Jesus is shifting Peter's focus. He's beginning to understand that this is, this is so much weightier and that Jesus is using us in the most profound ways that we literally are the body of Jesus. We are the body. He's the head, and you and I are him on the earth. Oh, that's powerful stuff. And I would go more into it, but then I won't have time to do that. So let's go to Luke chapter 9, verse 20. No, not that one. Luke chapter, I'm going over. Oh, no, that is, I want verse 28, maybe. Luke 9. Yes, yeah, Luke 9, 28. Now that eight days after these teachings, Jesus took with him Peter, John, and James, and they went up on the mountain to pray. And as he was praying, the appearance of his countenance beca became altered, and his raiment, his, his raiment became dazzling white, flashing with brilliance of light. Uh, and behold, two men were conversing with him, Moses and Elijah, who appeared in the splendor and majesty and brightness and were speaking of his exit from, his, from life, which he was about to bring to realization at Jerusalem. Now Peter and those who were with him weighed down with sleep, but they were fully awake. They saw his glory and the two men who stood with him. And it occurred as the men were parting from him, Peter said to Jesus, I love the scripture. <laughs> this is, you can, you can write this, Jesus, I mean, Peter sticks foot in mouth. Uh, Master, it is delightful and good that we are here and let us construct three booths or huts, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah, not noticing or knowing what he was saying. But even as he was saying this, a cloud came and began to overshadow them, and they were seized with alarm and struck with fear as they entered into the cloud. And then there came a voice out of the cloud saying, This is my son, my chosen one, or my beloved. Listen to and yield to and obey him. Oh. And then the voice died away, and Jesus was found alone. 
and they kept still and told no one at the time any of these things that they had seen. Now, I don't know about you. <laughs> How many times in your life have you thought, well, I got a plan for that? <laughs> I know exactly what to do in this moment. I am chosen to see Jesus change right in front of me. Can you even, ma- can you even imagine? I'm thinking, if you see Jesus on the mount, okay, that already is crazy. But then you see Moses and Elijah. I'm like, if there's ever a time in history for you to shut your mouth, this is it. You know what I mean? Like, this is it. Don't say a word. Don't be a dodo head. Like, you know what I mean? But Peter, he begins to have a plan. I'm going to construct three booths. Like, this seemed right to him. All of a sudden, this was, this was the perfect plan. We're going to keep the three of you here, and we're going to just worship the three of you on this mountain. It's going to be awesome. It's going to be great. Because God's not into your plan, though. Amen? So he's about Jesus and Jesus alone. Like, that's it. The plan is Jesus. And I don't know about you, but there's a time in your walk with God when you realize, I was a dodo head. Okay, yes, I had a plan. But there's a greater work involved here. It's Jesus alone. Jesus had to die. He had to be resurrected. Amen? But I want you to think about all the times you, you thought you could, you could construct your life in such a way that you can keep Jesus where he was. And he's like, I will not be hemmed in by anybody, regardless of how wonderful this is that I'm showing you. Amen? So there's a reason why I said that. We'll keep going. Let's go to Luke 22, verse 31. Just keep it in your mind. Keep it in your mind. I really am almost finished. What did I say? 22 what? 31. Okay. Yeah. He says, Simon, Simon. <laughs> this is so bad. <laughs> Y'all, they, were, they were all arguing about who's going to be greater. Right? You know, so carnal. Anyways, uh, and then J- Jesus says to him, he says, Simon, Simon, or Peter, uh, Satan, listen, Satan has ex- uh, excessively, has asked excessively that all of you be given up to him out of the power of keeping of God that he might sift you like grain. Now, I want you to understand something. Satan was asking to sift all the disciples, but Jesus, in his super intelligent way, just decided to tell Peter. Now, Peter's kind of vain, you know. So if all the people that Jesus probably shouldn't be pointing out in this moment, it's, G- it's Peter, but, P- you know, Jesus knows what he's doing. So Peter is on defense now because all of a sudden, yeah, he, he totally forgets the whole thing that he has asked for all of you, and all he's focused on is Jesus is talking to me, rut row, you calling me out in front of my buddies here, and I don't like this. And so he's like, look. He says, but I pray especially, I pray especially for you, Peter. All of you are going to be sifted, but you suck and you're weak. So I'm praying harder for you. You know what I mean? So you know Peter's ego is like, wow. <laughs> because he's walking away from Mount Transfiguration like, <laughs> I was chosen to see that. And now all of a sudden Jesus is hammering him. <laughs> and he says, I prayed you that your, that your own faith may not fail. I know Peter's like, why aren't you praying for John? He's the ninny, right? You know what I mean? Like, that's how he felt about John. John was the little one. John was the one, you know, oh, I want to be next to you. Nah, nah, nah. <laughs> that's how I see them. Amen. So John was the youngest. Anyways, so he says, look, I pray that your own faith may not fail you. And when you, and when you yourself have turned again, strengthen and establish your brethren. Peter did not hear any of that. He did not hear you're going to strengthen the other guys. Nope. All Peter heard was, I'm being sifted, and I am weak. I am being sifted, and I am weak. I am being sifted, and I am weak. So, amen. Amen. And Simon said to him, Lord, let me tell you how strong I am. (laughs) Tell me I'm weak. I don't have faith. I'm ready to go with you both to prison and to death. That is so, he is so defensive right now. Jesus is just picking that bruise like he does. He just pushes it. Does it hurt? I'm like, oh, I just want to punch you. And Jesus sees Peter's weakness. He knows Peter has got a lot of pride inside of him. And so Jesus just starts to mess with them because Jesus likes to mess with you. I know he loves you. You are his beloved, but he likes to mess with us. He wants to get out everything that's not of him. 
but it's for purpose. There's a reason why he's doing it, for you to strengthen those that are around you, okay? But Peter's like, I'm ready to die, and I will go to prison. And he's like, I am not that weak. It's not happening. <laughs> so Jesus has to confront this pride in Peter, and he takes it to a whole other level. And Jesus said, I tell you what, Peter, before a single cock shall crow this day, you will three times deny that you even know me. Uh, this was so foreign to Peter. He was like, there's no way I'm denying Jesus. Have you ever had Jesus confront you on something? You're like, not in me. <laughs> what? I'm not swayed by the opinion of man. What? Oh, my gosh. I went through that so bad when I used to write the devotionals. Oh, I would get all these emails. I got them from all over the world. You know, like people just loving me, loving me, and just let one person say one critical thing. And I'm like, oh, no, you did not. You did not correct my grammar, my punctuation. You did not say that. I mean, I would want to respond. And my whole world would be kicked upside down because all of a sudden what somebody said about me. And Jesus pointed out to me that I didn't actually acknowledge it, but I was actually being very moved by the, the praise as well. So as soon as I got criticized... And it didn't even matter. I could have had 10 emails telling me how wonderful I was, and I am. And then I could have one say, you suck. And I'm like, oh, I got one that said I suck. I mean, it's all about that. And Jesus is like, you cannot be moved by man, by man's opinion of you. And I was so hurt. I'm like, I'm never writing a devotional again. Blah, blah, blah. Then, of course, Sylvia's like, let's put him in a book. But anyways, um, at some point, Jesus begins to confront the pride in us. This is all about Peter's pride. And you and I, no matter how much we've accomplished and no matter how much we know that we're chosen, we need to understand that pride is going to kill us. And Jesus has to root it out of us because we're never going to be good for him as long as we are prideful and moved by the opinions of man. That's, I'm telling you, this lesson right here is one that you will go through over and over and over again because Jesus is constantly taking out the deep parts of us that need to be worked on. And he doesn't do it because we're bad. He does it because he loves us. And there's a greater call on our life. And Peter cannot hear it. He can't comprehend it. And I don't, maybe you're in the point right now where God's rooting out pride inside of you. Hang on. Hang on, beloved. There is a greater work for you and a, and, and a greater mission that God's going to put you into. Just hang on. Don't give up. Amen? All right. So let's go to the next one. Luke 39? Yes. So Jesus has to, you know, at this point, Peter's getting a revelation. It says in verse 49, he came up out and went, as was his habit, to the Mount of Olives, and the disciples also followed him. And when... Notice that for Sunday school people, notice that it says, was his habit, remember? You were the who of prayer, make a habit, okay. Um, it says, and then verse 40, and when he came to the place where he said to them, pray that you uh, may not all enter into temptation, and he withdrew from them about a stone's throw and knelt down and prayed, saying, Father, if you are willing, remove this cup from me, yet not my will, but always yours be done. And there appeared to him an angel from heaven, strengthening him in spirit. And being in an agony of mind, he prayed all the more earnestly and intently, and his sweat became like great clots of uh, blood dropping down upon the ground. And when he got up from prayer, he came to the disciples and found them sleeping from grief. And he said, why do you sleep? Get up and pray that you may not enter all into temptation. Man, Peter's weakness, all of their weakness, was glaring in front of them. Jesus tells them, look, the flesh is weak, but the spirit is willing in the most crucial time in the life of Jesus, they all fell asleep. Now, in verse 50, I won't, you can read down. Um, the soldiers come right after this to arrest Jesus, and Peter takes out his sword, and he cuts off the guard's ear. And then Jesus, looking at Peter, is like, this is not how we fight. This is not what we do. This is not the way you're going to win. And he takes the man's ear, and he heals it. And Peter, I'm sure, is thinking, wait a second. I am a fighter. 
And Jesus begins to teach us that the things of this world that we enter into, we're not going to fight carnally. We have to do things the way he says to do them. And they're always opposite of what our instinct is. And so Peter flings the sword and Jesus loves and heals. And then right after this, when Jesus is arrested, Peter denies that he even knows him three times, just as predicted. And Peter is beside himself. He cannot believe that he did this. It's absolutely foreign to his heart that he would deny Jesus. Man, I have been there. I have been there. I remember when I first got saved, I, I told, you know, because Ricky, he grew up Baptist and all that good stuff. He was my, he was my teacher, really, honestly, in the beginning. He would, he always helped me with the word of God. And I, when I first got saved, I just had faith. Like, I was just filled with the spirit, and I just had faith. Uh, it was just a, a real gift of, of God. And I would tell him, why do all these people have this word? Because I was reading the word, and it was just, I mean, when it said God was a healer, I, I just believed he healed. There was, I had no religious doctrine to mess it up. I just believed he healed. If he, it says he set free, he set us free. He said, lift your hands and worship. I'll lift my hands and worship. It did not matter what the word said. I took it just as simply as it is written, and that's all I wanted. And I remember telling him, how how do people have this in their lives and they're not in a good mood? I didn't understand. I'm like, how do people have this and, and yet they don't believe that God heals? And it says right here, he heals. And I was like, I, and I was, on, I was being sincere with my question, but I got a little prideful. I'm like, what's wrong with you people, you religious people? Amen. Because I was crazy at work. I was laying hands on people, and they were shocked, and I was obnoxious. Jesus told me, look, you can be bold, but you are being brash right now, and you are not being a witness for me. I was like, well, I rebuke you in the name of Jesus. No. Uh, <laughs> I could not imagine not believing the word of God. And I can, I can nearly remember where I was when I sat down one day and Jesus said, you've become like the people you used to judge. All of a sudden, I wasn't loving the way I used to love. And I wasn't believing the way I used to believe. And I wasn't reading the way that I used to read. And I wasn't praying the way that I used to pray. And I became like the very people in the beginning that I said, what is wrong with you? It was a rude awakening for me. So Jesus is always combating the pride inside of us. And he wants us to be cleansed, set free, and more like him. So let's go to John chapter 21. We'll go to verse 1. We have two more scriptures, and then we're done. John 21. Peter was really in a whirlwind. He just did not understand. He had left everything to follow after Jesus, and he had been told he was called. He, I mean, he had healed the sick. He had set people free from demons. He was being used by God to do miracles, and then all of a sudden, Jesus is dead. Like, what do you do when the one that you follow is not in front of you anymore? You know, we talk a lot in the Song of Solomon uh, on Wednesday nights about, you know, the test of God's re removal of his manifest presence. And when you don't have Jesus where you feel him and you see him every day, when he removes that so that you have to go through a period of time where you press on even though you don't see him and feel him, that, that, is, that is such a crucial test in everyone's life. And Peter was going through that test literally because he had Jesus in the flesh and we go through it spiritually now. And Jesus and Peter didn't know what to do. So Peter went back to, to the one thing that he knew he did well, and that was fishing. Peter was a great fisherman. 
And so when Jesus wasn't around anymore, he was like, that's it. I'm going back to the thing that I know to do, so I'm going to go back fishing. And so that's what he's doing. So it says, after this, Jesus uh, let himself be seen and revealed himself again to the disciples at the Sea of Tiberias, and he did it this way. They were together. Uh, there were together Simon Peter and Thomas, the twin, and Nathaniel, also the sons of De- Zebedee, and the two others of his disciples. Simon Peter said to them, I'm going fishing. And they said to him, we're coming with you. <laughs> Because Peter is a leader. So they went out and they got in the boat and throughout the night they caught nothing. Okay, so he's a professional fisherman. Front row. He's not catching anything. There's nothing worse than when you decide, I'm going to go do what I want to do because that's all I know to do. And Jesus is like, nope, not blessing it. Nope, not blessing it. Nope, not blessing it. And you're like, why am I doing? It's so frustrating. Oh. So morning was already breaking when Jesus came to the beach and stood there. However, the disciples did not know that it was Jesus. And Jesus said to them, boys, you don't have any fish, do you? (laughs) I love this. (laughs) Oh, my God. This is so funny. Like, can't you just hear Jesus telling you, oh, you got no faith, do you? (laughs) You ain't got no money, do you? You don't got no joy, do you? What's, what's missing in your life? <laughs> Everything. <laughs> Overhaul David in Jesus' name, Lord. Okay. But Jesus points out the one thing that's supposed to be working for you. And he's like, how's it going? <laughs> I love this about Jesus. I, lo- I just love his attitude. I do. I tell you, because I'm. it's so sarcastic to me. I love it. That's how I am. Amen. So, look, I... Ha- I've been in the car, because y'all know I get road rage, because people don't know how to drive. And it's just absolutely, it's just intolerable. It's just so irritating. I'm like, slow down, so I can keep right. You know what I mean? So I'm like, I, and I like, I lose my peace. And Jesus is like, how that working for you? I'm like, Rah! or I will, you know, say some things to people in the car, you know. The blood of Jesus washes me clean. Amen. Uh, but anyways, Jesus is like, one time I got so mad at him. Okay, here's a story for you. I got so mad at him. Uh, okay, don't be offended at me. I called him a son of something. Okay, I was mad, and I called him a son of something. And I slammed the door of the bathroom. And I was like, oh, I told him off. And Jesus said, why are you calling his mama names? I was like, <laughs> what? He's like, she ain't got nothing to do with this. I was, that phrase right there is not, that's really not about him. That's about her. (laughs) It's horrible when Jesus does this to you. I'm just like, that's not even fair. Now I've got to find something else to say because now I just lost the battle. And I'm all about winning. So anyways, yeah. So anyways, Jesus will like, I'm in the car and he'll say something to me. He'll be just like, you know, why are you yelling at her? Like, stop it. You're ruining my, you're ruining my attitude. He's like, exactly. It's an attitude that needs to be ruined. Amen. So he says, boys, have you got any meat? <laughs> you got any fish? <laughs> and they answered him, no. I like how it has an explanation point because they were like, duh, no. And he said to them, cast the net on the right side of the boat and you'll find some. So they cast the net and now they were not able to haul it in. Oh, it was such a big catch. He He didn't tell them not to fish, but at his word. It may not be that you're doing the wrong thing. You're just not doing it with the word. (laughs) That's good. And the disciple whom Jesus loved, okay, that just gives you some indication about why I said what I said about John a minute ago, because John's writing this. John wrote, the disciple who Jesus loved. Instead of saying, and then I looked up and saw Jesus. He didn't say that. He's like, no, the disciple. (laughs) It's actually not a bad thing. It's a good thing. He said to Peter, it's the Lord. And Simon Peter, hearing him say that it was the Lord, look at Peter. He put on his upper garment where he was stripped for work, and he sprang into the sea. Peter hears the word after denying Jesus. That's him. And he jumps out of the boat, and he starts making it to the shore. 
And if you read on, Jesus cooks them breakfast, and then he begins to restore Peter. Do you love me? Do you love me? Do you love me? So for every denial, Peter begins to be restored. You fast forward to the book of Acts, and you see Peter in the upper room praying with the 120 other, 119 other people. And the Spirit of God fills the upper room. They are all filled throughout their being by the Spirit of God. Peter gets up, he goes outside, and preaches the most powerful message he'd ever preached in his life. 3,000 men were saved that day. And all of a sudden, the kingdom of God is opened up in this amazing, real way. And here's my point. Peter was extremely flawed. He had a lot of issues, as do we, amen. We all struggle with pride. We all struggle. We all get out of the boat where we all start sinking. We all, we do understand that we're called and that we're chosen and God's created us. We have all this information. All, none of us are different than Peter. And we all make mistakes. But the Bible tells us that we overcome by the blood of the lamb and by the word of our testimony. And so here's the thing that Jesus wants you to understand today. I want you to look at someone next to you and tell them, I'm still here. Come on, I'm still here. I'm still here. You have encountered all kinds of obstacles. No matter what storms you have been through, no matter what hard things you have gone through, no matter what it is that has come against you, you're still here. You're still here. You're still fighting and you're still going through. You may not be doing it all perfect the way that you want to do it, but bless God, you are still here. See, Noah got drunk. Now, I'd get drunk too after I've been on a boat for six months with my family. Amen. <laughs> the first thing he did was plant a vineyard. I'm like, amen. You know what I mean? <laughs> but Noah got drunk. Moses, he smote the rock twice. David committed adultery and murder. Jonah, <laughs> I ain't going. <laughs> he went the opposite direction of where, the way God was telling him to go. <laughs> You're not done. You are not done. It doesn't matter what part of your life that you're in right now. It does not matter. You're still here. And we sang today that no matter what, God's promises are faithful. And that he cannot promise something to you and I and not accomplish that thing in our lives. So I don't care where you're at on your journey. And no matter how bad you think you are or how screwed up you think you are or what's the, how bad this storm is, it's not going to overtake you because you're still here. And you're still called and you're still chosen and God still wants to use you and you're still being perfected and he still loves you. You're still here. You're not done. And your end is going to be like Peter's. You're going to accomplish what God has created you to do. You are a threat to the enemy. And your testimony is I'm still standing. I'm still here. I was thinking the other day, you know, we, we went through a pretty serious war the last couple of years. And I was kind of like moping around, beating myself up because I'd let some things kind of fall that I was pretty disciplined in. And I was, I was feeling really bad about myself. And I was like, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm so sorry, Lord. You know, all how that all goes. When you're feeling like a slug, and so you're just you're, you're recounting all your failures. And 
And I just began to question where I was. And the Lord just shook me. And he said, you may not be running after me the way that you used to run, but you're still looking. You're still looking my way. And even though you may not feel that you're doing it perfect, all I'm worried about is are you looking my way? Because we can get so fixed on how, what we're not doing. But you know what? I am still here. It was a hell of a battle. It was exhausting. It was hurtful. It was painful. It was a horrible storm. There are moments that I walked on the water, and there were lots of moments I was sinking to the bottom like a cement block. But you know what? I'm still here. And God's still going to use me, and I'm still going to have every promise he's ever given me fulfilled. Every prophecy he's ever prophesied over me is still going to happen. It does not matter. We are all still here. We cannot look about what, who's not with us or what, you know, what we've done wrong. Guess what? It doesn't matter. You're still here. God's still going to use you. You have purpose. And I'm telling you, we prophesied the beginning of the year how this was a year of new beginnings. And I have seen it. I have seen people just, they're getting hammered by different kind of things that are coming their way. And I'm telling you what, it is just a sign and a wonder because what God's going to do in and through you is going to be fantastic. And the reason why you're going through the sickness and the reason why you're getting bad reports and the reason why the relationships are rocky or you don't have the job you want or your finances are all kinds of crazy, it is just a testimony that what God has said to you is going to happen. I have never been more encouraged than I am today. James was praying this morning and he just began to pray over every heart, courage and the strength to keep on going, to keep on asking, to keep on knocking, to keep on seeking God, no matter what. You are not defeated. You are an overcomer. You are the head and you are not the tail. You are over and you are not underneath. You are victorious. You are not overcome by any enemy in your life. You are whole. Come on. You need to know who you are. We all do. I don't care what stronghold is that's trying to pull you back into the world. It cannot have you. Jesus' hand and his presence is on your life and you will not be taken away. I, look, as soon, I remember, as soon as God told me to prophesy in, the, in December, I was like, I was excited. At the same time, I knew that that didn't mean war wasn't coming. But what it did mean was that no matter what did come our way, we were going to overcome it. You're still here. Yes. Your time's not over yet. Yes. Oh, Jesus is so good. Yes. Can we stand? I really feel like the Spirit of God wants to move this morning. If you need to leave, your, we, we love you. We dismiss you. We'll see you Wednesday. But if you need prayer this morning, yes. I just want you to come up and pray. If you need to rededicate your life to Jesus and say, you know what, I've been running the wrong way. I've been trying to build a hut and do things my way, but guess what? I want to do it just Jesus alone, just Jesus alone. Then I want to encourage you. Look, I don't, I'm not a believer that you got to repeat a prayer with me because Lord knows I am not your Savior. But I can pray with you. Only you can handle your heart with God. I can't do that for you, but you can. And I'll pray with you in agreement. And I'll pray the Spirit of God fill you to overflowing. But if you're running from God, I want you to run back. He was speaking about the prodigal son this morning, and I'm like, oh, yes, yes. Jesus, I remember that day when I ran to him. I was a broken, suicidal, horrible, depressed woman. And Jesus accepted me just the way that I was. And he's no different today. Thank you, Lord. Father, we just give our hearts to you this morning. Yes, yes. And I just thank you so much that you want to encourage us this morning because you are well pleased.
you love us so much and you want to encourage us this morning to keep running and to keep pursuing and to keep asking and to keep knocking that you have what you've already instilled in us that we're going to run the race and we are going to cross the finish line that there's nothing in this world that's going to bring us down that we're still here and that by our testimony this morning we are overcoming father i ask for the encouragement of your spirit and the truth of your word just to come upon every single heart that our vision would begin to change that the creativity inside of us would be stirred up again that dreams and vision would begin to come back into our hearts in full force that we would lift our faces to you and know once again that you are ours and we are yours Holy Spirit, whatever you want to do in our hearts this morning, we've already said do it. And Father, now I'm asking that you would complete whatever you have willed for us this morning. In Jesus' name. If you want prayer this morning, I want you to come up. The leaders will pray with you. We'll anoint you with oil. We'll do whatever God tells us to do. Amen. Let's worship Jesus for a little bit. Again, if you have to go, we love you. And we'll see you Wednesday.
James coming. I feel James coming. I feel James breaking. I feel James breaking. I feel James coming. I feel James coming. I feel James breaking. I feel James breaking. I feel change coming. I feel change coming. I feel change breaking. I feel come on. I feel change coming. I feel change coming. I feel change breaking. I feel change breaking. I feel change coming. 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 I feel change breaking. I feel change breaking. Everybody bow their heads. Reach over and grab the hand of someone. Just bless them. As I pray, I want you to pray over them. Dear Heavenly Father, we lift up every heart this morning. And we speak life to it. We ask, Father God, for your blessing. Father God, there's dreams and, and wants and desires that are just... They, they seem to be lingering and, and holding up and, and being held up, Father God. And we just ask for that, that, that dam to be broken, Father God. Yes. And for the flood of blessing that you have for us, Father God, to come pouring out and pouring forth, Father God. The windows of heaven opened up, Father God. There's been seed after seed after seed planted in word and in deed and in finances, Father God. And, and we seem like there's no harvest. But, Father God, the harvest is today. Yes. And it begins to pour out, begins to come yes. forth, Father God, and bring in, Father God, the storehouse will be full. And, Father God, we thank you for it. And we praise you for it. I thank you, Father God, that there are benefactors. There are people out there, Father God, that have uh, wealth, Father God, that are going to begin give to your people, Father God, pressed down, shaken together, running over. And, but, Father God, there's souls out there, Father God, that need the Savior. And, Father God, we're going to be lights on a hill, Father God. And, Father, we're going to point them in the right direction, Father God. We're going to be open arms to the prodigals, Father God. For those that are, are, are feel like uh, they are sinners and not worthy, Father God, we're going to make them feel comfortable and welcome, Father God, as you harvest those souls and bring them in, Father God. Let us be uh, uh, workers in the field, Father God. Let us bring forth. Your people, Father God, let us, uh, 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 we ask that you send, Father God, more people to help bring in the ha harvest, Father God, yes. the north, the south, the east, and the west. We say come forward, uh, Father God. We say come forth in Jesus' name. We thank you for the gifts that they have, that they bring to, for us to help complete the vision that we have for this ministry, Father God, to do the work of the, uh, uh, of the ministry, Father God. We thank you, Father God, that more are coming to set in place. The, the drummer, the, the electric guitar, Father God, children's ministry, nursery, Father God, uh, men and women's ministries, Father God, small groups, Father God, uh, uh, to be sent evangelists to uh, other nations, Father God. You have many things for this place to do, Father God, and we need, we need support, need help, Father God, and we thank you for it. We praise you for it. The vision is alive, Father God. The portrait is is, is being put together, and each pixel is coming together. Father God, we thank you for it. We praise you for it. And all God's people said, hug 14 people before you go. Tell them you love them. Squeeze them tight. We thank you for being here this morning. Bye-bye.